thank you guys so much for coming. This is, I think, our fourth in our backyard series this this year in 2023. And I am very happy to welcome uh, Haley Satter, who is our ag agent in Wacomico County. And she's going to talk all about fruit production today, which I know we always get tons of questions about because fruit is very yummy. So without further ado, uh, Haley, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, I, uh, I love talking about fruit. And if you were present at any of the backyard um, gardening talks um, in previous years. Um, you may have already heard me talk about some fruits, but this is going to be kind of a general presentation talking about all kinds of different fruit um, that we can grow in the mid-Atlantic. Um, I mean, I'm a, I am live in a certain part of Maryland, but uh, most of these fruits we will be talking about um, can be grown across the mid-Atlantic. So that's really what this is geared at. And I kind of just mentioned this, but um, what I'm going to be covering in this talk is um, a bunch of the fruit that we can grow here. I'm certainly not going to talk about every single species of fruit that can be grown um, in the mid-Atlantic because that would be a much longer talk. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the cool or fun advantages of growing fruit, um, but then also consideration because growing fruit is I would say significantly different than growing vegetables. Um, and that has mostly to do with how long you have to keep them in the ground or how long it takes them to reach mature fruit bearing age. Um, and then uh, an overview of all these different fruits. What I am not going to be talking about um, in this talk is really, I'm not really going to go over like the step-by-step, -step, this is how you plant an apple tree. I'm not going to be talking about commercial production or how to grow fruit for money. This would be more like a home gardening or homesteading um, type uh, systems that I'm talking about, or at least some of the cultivars we'll talk about are better for home gardeners. And then um, non-traditional growing systems. If you've ever heard of permaculture, I'm not going to really be talking about that or how you would produce fruit organically. Um, and I'm really not going to be talking about um, conventional, you know, commercial pr fruit production either. This is really for small scale um, in your backyard or on a small plot of land type folks. Uh, when I talk about the mid-Atlantic, because I know we have people um, who attend these talks that are not just in Maryland, you can grow all different kinds of temperate fruits here. And the ones that this talk is focused uh, mostly on are strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, apples, cherries, grapes, peaches, plums, and pears. There are many more like beach plums and... Uh, um, gooseberries and, you know, things that are less common in grocery stores that you can grow. Um, but that would just be more than we can fit. And it doesn't, just because we're going to talk about all these fruit does not mean that they are going to be easy. And we'll get into why that is, why fruit can be more challenging than vegetables. What I want you to do, I guess, with this talk is sort of really seriously consider if like growing say a couple of apple trees is worth it for you. Um, and, you know, if, if you're not going to plant a whole orchard, what that would mean. Uh, and so I guess I think it would be really cool. Are any of you guys already growing fruit? Do you want to just put that in the chat? And then if you are growing fruit, what types of fruit are you growing? Um, just because that'll kind of give me a cool idea of what what you already know and what you have experience with. Um, and then if you're not growing any fruit, you can mention what kind of fruit you want to grow. Um, I see uh, somebody growing blueberries, currants, um, apples, strawberries, aronia. Wow, that's brave. Um, I I've tried aronia and I think that they're more of a smoothie berry, I think, than a fresh eating berry. Oh, persimmons, those are another good choice for here. Um, but they're, they're not in this talk. Peaches, grapes, cherries, and blackberries, strawberries, grapes, raspberries. Let's see. Oh, pawpaws. Pawpaws are another good choice that um, didn't make it into this talk, but they're another cool native. Um, so maybe I'll have to do a pawpaw talk next year. Elderberries. Those are really fun and native. But yeah. Uh, oh, an avocado. That one will be, that'll be fun, but challenging. Those can't really live outside in Maryland. Um, and then I see strawberries. Oh, watermelon. So watermelon, 
are fruit, of course, but um, they didn't make it into this talk because they they grow more like a vegetable in a vegetable type system. So, oh, Myers lemon, but it's kept indoors. Good, very smart. Um, because I had a little citrus tree that I was just kind of growing this year, and then it um, got toasted by the first freeze because I forgot to bring it inside. Okay, so we'll kind of get going. Um, just a couple of things to keep in mind if you really want to establish, you know, a, a planting of a crop, um, but especially for fruit, you should probably know what the crop needs. Um, fruit, especially different kinds of fruit, may have very different needs than what your vegetable plants might need. A lot of these fruit require cross-pollination, so you need to plant more than just one tree. Um, apples are an example of this. Peaches are not an example of this. Peaches can um, can be self-fertile, still require pollination from bees or other insects, but they, they can uh, the same tree can pollinate its own flowers. If you are planting a significant amount of fruit, I would say it's a really good idea to map it out, um, especially if you have different varieties, because I can't tell you the number of times I've gone to farms or especially people that have a, a small row of something, but they have a whole bunch of different plants, uh, varieties in there, and they don't remember which variety is which. And if one variety starts dying off and you want to replant, it's really helpful to know which one died off. Um, so I would say make a map. Um, and kind of like identify if you have different areas of soil or maybe a low spot. Most fruit don't like sitting um, in wet areas for significant periods of time. So that's usually a bad area to put fruit. And then make sure that you have the a, a means of irrigation, um, at least when you're first planting. So uh, in a lot of apple orchards, say, they might not have a dedicated irrigation system um, to them, but in their first year of growth, especially when you have years like this where it's being very dry, at least where I'm at in Wicomico County, uh, you, you need some way to get those plants water. Okay, so longevity of fruit plantings. I think this is an important thing to think about because it, unlike a vegetable garden, you're going to have to live with what you plant um, for most of these crops. So uh, peaches, apples, cherries, plums, um, tree fruits are going to live for a long time, provided that they are taken care of. So minimum of 15 years, maybe up to 40 years. So if you are thinking about leaving your home in the next couple of years, might not be a good idea to plant um, peaches, apples, or cherries because you're not even going to get a crop before um, they they start to fruit. So uh, I think that's something to think about. Those are going to take a much longer time to get up and going um, and establish before they are mature enough to bear fruit, or at least make more than one or two fruit. You can have a peach tree for a couple of years, they'll so make a one or two peaches, but it's not really worth all the effort of taking care of the whole tree, in my opinion. Um, so you kind of got to be in it for the long haul. Uh, small fruits, um, grapes too, they, uh, a vineyard can last for a very long time. So if you're uh, planting grapes, um, just be aware that they're going to be there for a while. Uh, and then blueberries too can last between 10 and 30 years. Blackberries and raspberries are a little bit more short-lived, but um, blackberry and raspberry um, canes will produce fruit sooner. They'll, they'll be producing fruit in the second year of the planting, as opposed to most of these other fruit that we've just talked about that are not going to make fruit for at least four years usually or a significant amount of fruit for four to six or seven years. Um, and then strawberries are the most like a vegetable. Um, you put If you put them in the ground in the late summer, early fall, you will have a crop by the very next year. Um, so if you're not sure if you're going to live in a place for um, a long time, I would say start with strawberries. What you need to know, I know I, I did a strawberry talk last year, but um, I'm just going to kind of go over some of the more important aspects of growing them. Uh, there are two different types of strawberries you can grow, and they are June bearing, which are essentially determinate. Um, it means they bear all their fruit at once versus ever bearing, which are going to make fruit all summer long. So 
June bearing um, are relatively true to their name. Some of them are going to make fruit in May, uh, where I'm at. But if you're in a further, more northern part of the state, you can have fruit in June. Whereas the everbearers are going to be a little bit later, you know, going to make slightly smaller fruit, but you can have fruit all summer long. So the way farmers usually plant strawberries is probably not the way you would plant them in your garden. But um, I just kind of wanted to show you how they um, how they fill up their space. Um, and in a matted row system, which is what we have here on the left, um, where there's no plastic, um, those strawberries will eventually start to cover this whole field after a couple of years. So they are pretty aggressive spreaders. The June bearing uh, strawberries are only going to have that like small window of three to four weeks, um, but they're going to make bigger fruit. The cultivars that we recommend uh, for the mid-Atlantic are things like All Star, Del Marvo, uh, Early Glow. That's an older, much smaller berried variety, but it's got pretty good flavor and it works well for home gardeners. It, does, it doesn't have a good shelf life, but if you're just picking and eating berries, Early Glow is a tasty one. Um, Flavor Fest is a new variety, newer-ish um, within the last maybe seven years. And that has been very popular with growers. Um, and when I say growers, I mean farmers. Um, so I think that's probably a good variety for home gardeners too. Jewel um, is an older type variety and Keepsake is one of the newest strawberry varieties developed for the mid-Atlantic. So that one's supposed to be pretty good too. As far as the everbearing strawberries, they're going to make all of their fruit um, a little bit later in the summer. They're not going to um, make as many runners and fill up that space quite as quickly as the June bearing varieties. And they are going to do better if they have temperatures below 90 degrees. So these are going to be better choices for you if you're in a part of the state with a little bit more elevation. You know, I'm on the eastern shore and it is hot and humid all summer long. Uh, and that's not very good for fruit quality, especially soft fruits like strawberries and raspberries. Uh, they, they're, they're delicate and they don't handle the heat quite as well as something with a firmer um, fruit texture. But if you do want to have strawberries all summer long um, and you don't mind if they end up getting a little bit of sun scald and some spots, you can grow things like seascape. Um, Tristar or Tribute. All right, so, oh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'm kind of, I'm doing this talk in the order of easiest fruit. So strawberries are probably the easiest to get established um, and also require the least amount of um, time and kind of investment to make work to um, the most difficult and more expensive type of fruit um, to get off the ground. So I would definitely say the next easiest fruit um, to start with in your backyard or garden are going to be blackberries and raspberries. And that's because they kind of grow like weeds um, once they get established. So they are biannual canes and they are very closely related. They're in the rubus uh, genus and they're both also um, native to the U.S., um, at least some types of them. There are other blackberries and raspberries um, from around the world. Uh, you will see them. I see blackberries all the time, um, you know, in farmers' fields, like on the roadside or at the edge of um, forests. So uh, you know that they are something that is meant um, to grow here. Okay, so the important thing to understand about blackberries and raspberries, and um, sometimes we just refer to them as brambles, uh, is that they they have a this biannual life cycle where the first year um, the new cane that comes out of the ground is called a primocane. These generally do not produce fruit, although there are some varieties where the primocanes do produce fruit. In the wild, uh, they will not produce fruit. And then the floricanes are the second year canes, and those are going to make fruit or start producing flowers right about now. I'm seeing um, flower buds starting to develop on my blackberries at home and uh, they will make fruit in the summer, usually in June um, for the blackberries that I grow. I will say um, the raspberries are, at least the raspberry varieties I have, um, are they're making fruit all summer long at different times, but I have five different varieties. 
The biggest problem that I see in raspberries and why I don't think there is a lot of commercial production of them um, in places like the Eastern Shore is that um, they have big issues with sun scald um, and they get heat stressed. So one thing I would recommend to um, you um, people who are doing this at home, find an area um, in your yard uh, where they can get some afternoon shade. So a lot of raspberries are actually produced under um, a certain amount of shade cloth. Um, so even though it may say that they need full sun, if you can give them some dappled shade in the afternoon, um, they may do better and you can reduce um, some of the sun scald injury that we have here in this top photo. Another problem that we see a lot uh, is Japanese beetle, honestly. Uh, they love raspberries. Um, they go after them. And that's about how many Japanese beetles I see on my um, fruit if I don't get to it in time. So they, those are kind of an irritating pest that you're going to encounter. Spotted wing drosophila, I'll talk about um, in the blackberry section. They are another pest um, that become more of a problem the later you get into the season. Um, and they are basically just fruit flies. Okay, so brambles, um, both blackberries and raspberries um, are naturally thorny, but we have bred them to be thornless and that is so great. Um, so there are a lot of new thornless blackberry varieties coming out because if you have ever picked blackberries from a thorny variety, you know how horrible and painful that is. Um, I would say that blackberries are have worse thorns than raspberries. Um, I, I come up much more somehow. I don't know that it, if this is true, but when I have when I've worked with thorny blackberries, um, it's it's worse than working with th thorny raspberries. So I would just say never plant any um, thorny blackberries, and I will only talk about thornless varieties. Um, raspberries, there aren't as many thornless varieties. And I think that's also because it's not as big of a deal on the raspberries. Um, but there, there are some if you prefer to plant only thornless um, varieties. So those would be Joan Jay, uh, Camby, and uh, Nova. So here are some of the varieties um, that we recommend for the Mid-Atlantic. And I don't know if we mentioned this, but you don't have to write all of these down. We will share the slides with you. Um, so you can also, uh, you can either re-watch this or just look at the slides if you want um, any of this information, like all of these um, raspberry varieties. But here are some of the varieties that um, work well here. And I would say I really like Anne, um, also double gold. Uh, I, I like these um, golden varieties. Uh, I also have Prelude. I think that one's okay. Um, but I, I kind of go after fruit with um, good or strong flavors. And I don't really care as much about things like um, the storage life, because when I'm harvesting it, um, I'm usually just immediately eating it or eating it, you know, on a salad or something like that. You can take a look at this list and here's, you know, some of the traits for these varieties. There are a whole bunch of new blackberry varieties that I've kind of already talked about. Most of these um, are considered to be semi-erect, um, which means that they, they have a more upright uh, structure. Most of these varieties are being bred in um, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Oregon. And there are a couple new um, primocane fruiting varieties of blackberries. I will say that I don't really like the primocane fruiting varieties because when they fruit on the primocane, you have a yield, uh, you usually have a slight yield penalty um, the next year on the floricane because they put all that energy into making fruit in the fall. So they have a little bit less energy stored for the spring to make new fruit. Um, the other reason that I really don't like fall fruit is because all of your pests are worse um, once you get into September. So the pressure from, I, I just wrote down SWD, but that is spotted wing drosophila, um, becomes way more of a problem in the fall because those populations have a chance uh, in the spring. You may start out with, you know, a few flies um, or a few of these uh, fruit flies. By the end of summer, you have a lot of fruit flies um, just out there. So I prefer fruit that, it, um, fruit that is made earlier in the summer. 
So here are some of the thornless cultivars of blackberries. Um, I have in purple the ones um, that kind of have uh, improved flavor, uh, more sweetness. Um, so these ones with kind of spacey names, Galaxy, Eclipse, and Twilight, those are recent releases from uh, the University of Oregon, or not University, they're from Oregon. Uh, I think it's a collaborative effort between the university there and um, the USDA which is the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, and then there are a bunch of new varieties that also came from uh, Arkansas. And the two that I would say, if you think that blackberries are kind of too sour and don't have very good flavor, try growing Cotto and Ponca. I have them and they are, they're better than a lot of the older varieties from um, Arkansas. And most of the Arkansas varieties have um, Native American names like Arapaho, Apache, um, Natchez, Navajo. Those are all um, Arkansas type varieties. What I will say about blackberries is they are just hardy plants. They are vigorous growers. They make um, pretty thick, sturdy canes. And um, I've been very impressed with how well they do in the mid-Atlantic. I will say though, if you are going to grow blackberries, you need some kind of structural support for them. So uh, what growers do is they build these trellises. Um, you are welcome to do that in your backyard. Otherwise, plant them on a fence. Um, plant them in a place where you have the fence and then you can like rope them, and kind of tie them up the way you might tie up tomatoes. Um, because once they get loaded with fruit in the summer, um, they, they need that structural support to not um, fall over. Okay, so here's an image of spotted wing drosophila and how gross they are. <laughs> um, and you will have more of a problem with these uh, the later in the year the plants are fruiting. Okay, so another issue that I've seen on blackberries is this insect called um, strawberry clipper weevil. Uh, and what it'll do is make a little make a little hole um, in the flower bud and then you won't get a fruit there. Um, so I've seen that here. Um, I don't think it's usually too devastating. You're not going to lose your whole yield usually um, to this pest. And then the other one that you will potentially see is the red-necked cane borer, and that will make um, kind of this bulge here where it's tunneling um, in the bark. Uh, and if it's allowed to do this, you know, it can it can eventually kill off that cane. It's probably not going to destroy your whole planting. So in general, um, I don't see as many diseases on blackberries as I do on um, something like blueberries. You see a lot more diseases usually. Okay, so speaking of um, another thing you can grow around here, um, grapes are another potentially good choice, depending on what you like. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of grapes. So there are wine grapes, which are different than table grapes, which tend to be seedless. And then there are also Concord or what are called Labrusca grapes. Those are what are used in like jelly and a lot of juices. Um, and then there are muscadine grapes. And a lot of people, I think, didn't know what muscadine grapes um, were until kind of recently, I have only started seeing them in grocery stores in the last couple of years. Um, they are the picture on the top right. Um, they kind of, they look like marbles, like very large marbles. Um, and they really don't taste like a table grape at all. Um, they have, well, I'll talk more about them, but uh, they can be another good choice for people here. Um, and then grapes are kind of complicated. Some of them are self-fertile, not all of them are self-fertile, and a lot of the muscadines are not self-fertile. Grapes, probably you know this, but they are usually grown on trellises because they are a very viney plant. I would not try to grow grape without giving it a fence or an arbor or like a carport structure or pergola um, that it can that it can climb up. And then it's very important that um, you basically train the grape to grow along the arbor so that, you know, it, it gets enough light on both sides. Um, and this is the way commercial people do it. I guess you don't have to train it um, as intensively as maybe a uh, vineyard is going to do it, but that's what you call it um, when you sort of adjust um, and prune the grape to, to grow along this arbor. 
So some of the table grape varieties that we recommend, these are seedless grapes. This is more like the kind of grapes that you would buy at the store. If you grow them at home, they will likely not be as big as the grapes you will see in the store, but they might have fantastic flavor. So um, Jupiter is a good one. Uh, Compassion, we've got Candice, Joy, Hope, Gratitude. Um, Tom Cord is a, it's half, um, half Concord grape. So it's going to have more of that Concord grape flavor. So more like, you know, a grape jelly and then um, Sunbelt, which has also um, got some Concord in it. So, oh, and Mars. Uh, so all these, these are going to be different types of colors of grapes. I, I think Jupiter is the one I really like, but I don't have as much experience growing grapes. I do know that they also have their problems. So one of the biggest diseases for the whole grape industry is Pierce's disease. This is caused by a bacterial pathogen. Uh, and what it does, if you start to see, if you have grapes and you start to see this in the bottom right picture where the leaves are kind of dying off um, at the tips, they are not able to get um, nutrients because essentially, you know, we have a um, a system in our body that transports blood around. Uh, plants have systems that transport water and sugar around in their tissue. Um, and when those get blocked, you have uh, kind of this, this systemic dieback that you're seeing um, here on, on these shriveled up grapes. So those weren't able to get um, the water and nutrients they needed, and they died on the vine. So Pierce's disease is a big problem. If you have it, just get rid of that plant. You can't solve it. There's nothing to be done about it. Um, and it's why there traditionally haven't been a lot of vineyards in the south um, of the United States, um, because this disease is more prevalent um, in hot, humid climates. Uh, another problem that is very common here in orchards is uh, powdery mildew, and it looks um, like it looks on most other plants. So if you've ever seen it in a vegetable garden, uh, it's going to look powdery and um, make the fruit really um, not nice. So that's something uh, that to be aware of if you have grapes. It's a common problem. Uh, so muscadine grapes. I really wanted to include these because they are the U.S. native grape species, and they tend to be hardier um, than table grapes. Uh, they have a thick slip skin. So a lot of people, when you put them in your mouth to eat them, you can kind of separate the skin um, from the pulp. And a lot of people will not eat the skin. Um, and then they also have seeds, which is not as nice as eating something seedless. But in general, they have a much stronger flavor than um, table grapes. So I think you know, there, there are definitely benefits to growing muscadine grapes. Um, they don't suffer from Pierce's disease, which is great. Um, and, but some of them do require, um, pollination. Uh, usually you can get these grapes in these different colors, like the gold, um, the kind of deep purpley red, and then, um, scarlet, which is, I think a hybrid of the red, uh, or of the purple and gold where you get this pretty, um, kind of bronzy reddish color. These are some of the varieties. Carlos and Noble are more used for wine. Um, I'm assuming that's because of yield, but then uh, some of the more friendly varieties to grow as a home producer are things like Alachua, Darlene, Jumbo, that one makes really big fruit, Fry, um, and Scarlet, which I just think is a very pretty grape. So um, blueberries are also a native plant to the U.S., I tend to say they are more difficult to grow than um, blackberries or raspberries or probably even grapes because they have some very specific needs um, for their growing environment. So they like high organic matter soils, um, upwards of 3%. If you've ever had a soil test done, most of us don't have soils that are upwards of 3% unless it's in our gardens um, where we have done things like put in compost and put in leaves to add or, or mulch of some kind. So we've added organic matter, but most of our soils um, don't have that. And then they also want these soils to be well draining. Um, so sandy soils, like what we have on the shore, are theoretically ideal, except that they don't have any organic matter. So it can be kind of tough to get the soil that they like right. 
kind of do better if you plant them on raised beds, especially if you are in a part of the state like where you have Piedmont or in the Piedmont where um, maybe you don't have as well draining soils. So then think about um, putting them up on raised beds. What raised beds help um, do is just allow gravity to sort of drain that water that's in the immediate root space better. So uh, if you're planting, you know, on a mound, uh, also, those roots are not going to be sitting in water if we have a rain event where you get four inches of rain at one time. Okay, so the other thing about blueberries that is very important to get right in the beginning, not after they're planted, is to get the soil pH right. They want a pH between 4.5 and 5. This is not a normal pH. If you are growing vegetables, you likely don't have a pH in your garden of five um, because five is usually too low for any of the other vegetables or fruit that you're growing, unless for some reason you're growing cranberries, which I don't think most people are. So the way you lower soil pH, you've maybe heard of liming. Liming is the opposite of what you would have to be doing for blueberries because liming brings up soil pH. So to bring down soil pH, uh, you can use things like pine needles, pine bark, or peat moss. Those are organic matter amendments that have an acidifying property, but they're, if your soil pH is at six or seven, that's not going to be good enough. You're going to need to add, um, oops, I say or inorganic sulfur, but it actually is organic. Um, sulfur pellets are just um, elemental uh, sulfur. They stink, and you are lucky if you can find them pelletized. Usually I find it powdered, um, but this is a way to bring down soil pH. Now, just because you go out and spread sulfur, um, even if you incorporate it into the soil, it will still take about a season to bring pH down. And if you are interested in figuring out how to bring a certain pH down or bring pH down in a certain area, you can talk to me because there are actually formulas um, to figure out if you have a hundred square foot garden um, and a certain type of soil and your pH is seven, we can sort of figure out how much sulfur you need to be applying. So blueberries are another one that do require cross-pollination. Um, they are generally going to make fruit in June or July, um, maybe more July if you're not on the eastern shore. If you're on the eastern shore, you'll get some in June. Also depends on what cultivar you plant. Some of the early cultivars, you know, uh, are going to make fruit a whole month earlier than the later cultivars. I would say that small plantings uh, may require bird netting because birds love blueberries. Once the birds figured out that I had blueberries in my yard, um, I didn't see very many more blueberries. Um, and they, they do make bird netting uh, if you if you have very aggressive birds like I do. It can be difficult to know what type of blueberries to plant. Um, I'm not going to list all the varieties here. I'm going to give you more of an idea. Uh, when you search for a blueberry on, um, if you're ordering them online, most of the varieties you'll see are northern high bush. Those are going to work just fine in Maryland uh, in general. Southern high bush, you maybe can grow here. They're not going to die um, in the winter because it gets cold, but what's going to happen is they might make their flower buds too early um, and then those flower buds and future fruit um, get frozen off in a late frost, say if we have a frost in April. So most of the southern high bush varieties I would not recommend for Maryland and the rest of the mid-Atlantic. I am growing some of them in a variety trial to see if they um, if they do okay here. But and then rabbit eyes, that is another species of blueberries. They are usually um, slightly, they're considered a little bit hardier um, than the the high bush blueberry. Um, they get bigger than a high bush blueberry, even though it's called a high bush. Um, but the fruit quality isn't quite as good. So if you want to compromise on the fruit quality, uh, you can you can grow rabbit eyes. I just don't think they're quite as good. So I don't I don't grow any. But okay, the primary issue that I see in home gardens um, with blueberries is that they are planted into places where people either didn't check the pH or were or check the pH and they were like, it's five or it's six. It'll come down or 
I'll apply something and it'll come down. Um, so most of the time what I see is pH is off. And when the pH is off um, or too high for blueberries, you start to see um, this chlorosis or this discoloration on the leaves where the veins are more of a dark green and uh, and the rest of the leaf uh, becomes more yellow. That happens because the plant is not able to take up iron anymore. And it's not able to take up a couple of other nutrients, but that's the one that is really obvious to me. Um, so I don't even need to sample the tissue or um, get it tested. I usually know right away. If I see this, that um, the planting is probably uh, on soils that have too high of a pH. So now I'm going to talk about tree fruit and I will, well, you'll see this um, coming up, but I would say these are going to be more complicated, difficult fruit to grow in the mid-Atlantic. That does not mean it can't be done, um, but you just need to be really intentional, intentional about it and think about what your uses are going to be for that fruit. Apples um, not only uh, take a long time to mature, so they're going to take probably at least five to seven years before they really get to be a mature size where they're producing, um, you know, a load of fruit that is useful to you. They also, if you think about it, are on the tree for a very long time in the summer. So they're going to be making flowers right about now, but they're, you're not going to pick those fruit until maybe September, sometimes October. Um, they really spend a lot of time on the tree. And oh, I misspelled varieties here. Ooh. Um, but many varieties um, uh, can make a larger crop um, some years um, as opposed to other years. So what you'll see is kind of like this every other year, a lot of times with apples, where one year it makes a big crop and then the next year it doesn't make a big crop. And then what you have to do in order to get apples of size that you really want, um, this is also true for peaches and other um, stone fruits, is you're going to have to thin them. So you really need to go through kind of early once the fruit starts to develop and take a whole bunch of the fruit off because they will make a lot more flowers than you really want them to make fruit. Otherwise, the fruit that you get will be all like this sized. Um, so that's something you're going to have to do. Most apples um, and a lot of other tree fruits are going to be grafted plants. If you, so what that, what that means is that they take Usually the apple variety that you're buying, if you're if you're buying buying, say, a gala, you're you're buying the top half of the plant is a gala. Um, and then the bottom half of the plant is actually some root stock. And so that just means that these two plants are kind of um, fused together. Somebody comes through and actually grafts them. You can see in this picture on the bottom right, there have been three graph unions. Um between uh, three scions that are likely all the same variety, or maybe they're, this could be a breeding program where they are three different varieties and they are all on the same rootstock. So the reason that you nurseries um, graft the plants is partially because the rootstocks may have better resistance to um, some of the soil borne problems. But the other reason is that the bottom of the plant is generally a dwarfing rootstock because an apple tree will otherwise get to be way too big. You don't want it to be that big because you don't want to get up on a 50 foot or 40 foot ladder um, and be picking apples. Most of us want to pick fruit, um, you know, at head height. Most of the time you're going to be buying um, an apple variety on a, on some kind of a dwarfing rootstock. Um, if you planted an apple from tree from seed, you will also not get um, the same type of plant that um, that the fruit came off of, but it would also not be dwarfing. So never plant an apple tree from seed. You'll be disappointed. Problems you are likely to encounter with apples. Um, I just don't see a lot of clean fruit. If I go to um, uh, an apple um, establishment um, in a backyard, so just be aware that probably if you plant apples, you not only have to plant several different varieties so they can all cross-pollinate, you're going to have a whole bunch of trees with fruit that might look like this. 
Some of the common things that you will see are maggoty spots on the outside where a moth or caterpillar um, burrowed its way in, um, where you may then have to sort of cut off and not use half of the fruit. Plum cruculio is very common. Uh, pests and apples, and they make these kind of, usually they're sort of D-shaped um, uh, bumps that you'll see on the skin. Apple scab is a disease um, that is common, but some varieties will have resistance to apple scab. And then uh, apple sawfly is another pest that will come through and kind of make this um, belt-shaped lesion across the apple skin. So I guess what I would say about apples is it's fine if you love apples and you want to grow them, that is great, but um, they are probably not going to be super beautiful grocery store fruit quality um, unless you are willing to spend a lot of money on chemicals. There are a lot of new apple varieties. I don't want to list all the apples because there are like a million types of apples, um, but uh, at least for fruit growers, it can be really expensive to get a hold of these new varieties. So just because you've seen a variety in the store doesn't mean that you will be able to necessarily buy it and plant it. Modern farms, generally, the only way they can make money is they're planting apples in high density, which you're probably not going to do at home. Um, but I think it's kind of, uh, that's the way the industry is going. And a nice thing about apples is that um, they can be grown on non-ideal soils. They they you know, most of the apple production in Maryland is um, in places like Washington County, where you have a little more elevation, um, but you don't have great soils for growing vegetables. They're kind of heavy and full of rocks. So that's an advantage of apples. Um, and again, they require cross-pollination. Um, if you're planting a lot of apples, you can't plant like too many of the same variety all next to each other. You're not going to get that cross-pollination. I don't think many people um, in this audience are planning on planting a whole acre of apples though. Another big challenge with apples um, that is a problem that's really hard to deal with and even commercial growers struggle with this one is fire blight. Um, this also affects things like pears um, and this is kind of what it looks like. It occurs in the spring. You know, we're probably almost past when you would start to see damage from fire blight, but just know this is um, one of the diseases that especially can kill back um, young apple trees. So, okay, bottom line with apples. I would say there is pretty much no way you're going to save yourself money by growing your own apples. That said, you know, with and then without regular chemical applications, it's going to be really hard to keep diseases and pests off. Even apple growers struggle with that. Apples can be a really good choice if you don't mind eating apples that might have bumps or spots on them. Um, and also if you are going to do something with all those apples. So if you just like to make applesauce or if you are a home brewer and you want to make cider out of apples, then I think it's great to grow a bunch of apples. But otherwise, when people just want to have like one or two apple trees, it can be really tough and just know that they're not going to look like the grocery store. Peaches and nectarines. Um, so peaches and nectarines are actually like the same plant. The only difference is like a single gene. Um, so they are really, the, the way you grow them is very similar. They do not require cross-pollination, um, but they do require pollination from bees. Um, and then generally um, growers now are kind of moving also into these higher density systems, um, but at least peaches... Um, they kind of have a different architecture than apples and um, the way you the growers usually prune them is to get them um, to be kind of a wider canopy so that it's easier to harvest from them. So there are hundreds of varieties of peaches and nectarines, which is why I'm not going to go into them. Um, a lot of them are developed or better for places like California where they don't have as many um, as much heat and heat. well they have heat but they don't have humidity and they don't have as many bugs and pests as we do so keep in mind that you should be looking for more east coast type um, varieties when you're looking for varieties and then 
many of these different varieties, the, the different varieties have different traits. So um, for instance, there are white and yellow peaches. Probably you've seen these at the store. Um, they can taste a little different. Generally, I would say white peaches, a lot of those are were developed in California and a lot of them don't do as well here. But just make sure you, you know, look at the variety you want to plant. There is what's called melting and non-melting peaches. Um, melting are the ones that kind of get soft and really juicy um, when they're truly ripe. And the non-melting type, um, those are the ones that stay kind of firm, um, more like apples. And I actually like the non-melting type, but a lot of people who grew up eating peaches do not like that. So um, be aware of that when you purchase peach variety, whether it's melting or non-melting, and know what you like. Um, there are the cling stones and the free stones. Uh, so that has to do with whether the stone adheres. So the stone is the pit in the middle, whether that um, stays attached to the skin or whether it's kind of like free in there. I don't think that's as important. There's also kind of like considered acidic peaches and um, sub acid or very non-acidic peaches. A traditional peach is going to have a little bit more acid. So a little bit of, a lot, peaches have a lot of sweetness and then like a little bit of tartness. And I don't like the sub acid varieties because they don't really have any tartness, but some people like that. And then there are round or more traditional shaped peaches. And then now donut peaches, um, which are kind of flat and smushed and they look really cute, but I don't think they're quite as easy to grow. Um, so I probably wouldn't plant them, but I know growers do plant them here on the East Coast. So one of the biggest challenges and probably the only one I'm going to talk about for peaches is um, this more or less ubiquitous problem on the East Coast, which is bacterial spot. So um, this is something that um, growers have problems with too, because there's not really a way to deal with this. Um, it's caused by a bacteria and it's going to make the skin of your peach look like this. If you don't care that the skin of the peach looks like this, or if you're going to turn your peaches um, into peach preserves or something like that, I would say um, don't worry about this. Uh, you can also look when you are reading about the variety that you want to plant, um, just look to see what level of resistance it has against bacterial spot. Because um, some of them, most things are not truly resistant, but some will have more susceptibility um, or resistance than others. Okay, pears. Pears are very closely related to apples, um, and they are also very susceptible to the disease I talked about called fire blight. Um, there aren't as many varieties of pears to grow um, on the East Coast, um, but they're kind of two commercial classes. So there are Asian pears and European pears. If you've, for some reason, never tried an Asian pear, I would say definitely try it because they, they taste very different than traditional pears. I would say pears have a lot of the same problems that apples have. And generally, they're maybe even a little bit more difficult to cultivate than apples. Um, plums. So there are actually wild plums that are native um, to the U.S. Peaches and apples are not native to the U.S. They both um, come from uh, more Asia, um, apples more uh, Western Asia, and um, peaches come from China originally. But some of the wild plums that exist in the U.S., um, have been, I think, interbred um, into, into some of the cultivated varieties. Now, they're also, so even though we have wild peaches, most of the um, cultivated types of peaches we grow here are, are either the Japanese type or the European type. So the Japanese type um, ripen a little bit earlier. They tend to be a little bit softer. Um, and they also, I think they have less cold hardiness um, than the European types. Uh, the European types are gonna be more making fruit in the fall. They also tend to be sweeter and have firmer flesh texture. So I, I personally would go with the European type um, and their management is more similar to peaches. So cherries, um, cherries are, are, are fun. Um, there are different types of cherries. There are sweet and sour cherries. Um, sour ch cherries uh, in the U.S. are pretty much grown for processing. Um, so unless for some reason you make pies or, or some kind of product out of sour cherry, don't plant one um, if you're planning on eating these fresh. Uh, if you want to eat fresh cherries, definitely plant a sweet cherry um, that require 
cross pollination. So you got to plant two different varieties um, in order to get fruit. They are most closely related to plums. Um, that said, they are they will produce their fruit earlier in the season. So um, that can be kind of an advantage. Um, they, like most of the other tree fruits, are going to take a long time um, to get going and grow and produce fruit. I don't think you have to thin them as much as you do um, for most of those other stone fruits. However, they're susceptible to a whole bunch of diseases. So just know that if you have a cherry or you plant a couple of cherries, I think they're very beautiful trees, but um, they can be sensitive to a lot of the diseases we have here on the East Coast. So kind of to wrap this all up, there are plenty of different types of fruit that you can grow. I haven't even listed all the fun things you can grow in the mid-Atlantic. These are just kind of the more conventional types of fruits, um, but you should figure out what you would like to grow and for how long you would like to grow it. Um, and then look at the, the variety of characteristics um, for these different perennial fruits and see what um, kind of suits your lifestyle. So if you're looking for something that doesn't require as much management, you know, maybe other than uh, probably the lowest level of management would be something like a strawberry. Um, but, you know, something like a blackberry is really easy and doesn't get a lot of diseases, but um, you are going to have to trellis it. So just think about those things before you um, decide to put in an order for hundreds of dollars um, for a whole bunch of new fruit. All right. I think that is everything um, I have on the screen. I'm Haley Sater. I'm the ag agent for uh, Wicomico County Extension. I would take questions now. If Yep. We have some questions and if anyone has any others, they can feel free to put them in the chat. That was a great chat. Uh, that was a great talk, Haley. I know I definitely learned some things that I have been doing wrong with my trying to grow fruit. So that was super helpful. So the first question I have is I've been trying to shape my honey crisp apple to an esperin form and I'm wondering if that's impacting the flowering and pruning because of the harsh pruning. I planted it about five years ago hoping I can cross-pollinate it with my crab apple when it finally does fruit. I'm not entirely sure about the architecture, the plant architecture um, that um, this person just mentioned, but what I do know about Honeycrisp um, is that they are notorious for growing very slowly. Additionally, most of the commercial fruit growers I know, um, they kind of hate Honeycrisp uh, because it has a whole bunch of problems that other cultivars of apples don't tend to have. I love eating Honeycrisp, um, but I just know that they tend to grow really slowly. So I would assume that you don't want to prune them too hard um, because they just take a lot of time to get to, to achieve that growth. Um, and I do. I know that, yeah, um, crab apples are, are a good pollinator for pretty much any, any apple tree. So that should work, but yeah, it's going to take, it's going to take a while before that tree is of fruit bearing size. So, um, any experience or, uh, with growing honey berries? I no. don't know of anyone who is growing them locally, but I am intrigued and wanted to try them. I haven't tried growing them. They're kind of, I think, aren't they a West Coast thing? I get a couple of these West Coast native fruits confused um, just because people aren't doing them yet here. Um, but that is not a reason to not try them. I think people should try them. Um, it's just that I actually don't have any experience with them yet. Okay. Uh, well, obviously we should try them this year. <laughs> Um, and in five years from now, we can report back because as we've seen, berry fruit tend or plants tend to take some time to establish before we can learn anything about them. Yep. Okay. Do you recommend planting a peach or apple tree in a container in the event you would want to move it to a new location if you were to say move homes? Probably not. They need to develop really, I mean, one of the nice things about a tree fruit is they develop this really robust huge root system so that they can tap into water, you know, in all kinds of places, which is why you don't have to really irrigate them once they, you know, get past the third or fourth year. But yeah, if you, the problem with growing 
any kind of plant in a container for too long um, is that especially something that needs to develop a big root system will become pot bound or container bound. Um, and what will happen is the roots will kind of start to grow into a spiral. Um, and then once you eventually plant it out into the larger, wider um, soil space, those roots have already kind of been trained um, to grow in this small space and it'll, they, they'll never really grow outwards the way they should. Um, so I would say, unless you have a very large container, I, I don't think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, is there a brand of Carolyn Clay for the home gardeners to spray on fruit trees? The commercial brand only comes in a 25 pound bag. It's hard to find, is expensive, and is too heavy for me to lift. Yeah, so that I feel like that's a, it's kind of an organic production question, and I don't know very much about organic uh, production of fruit. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I have said, found that I can find it um, at gardening centers. So maybe try looking not so much at the big box stores, but at your local gardening centers. I've definitely found it in smaller bags. I don't know about so much using it on fruit, whether or not it would work um, on fruit the same way it works on vegetables. I've used it on things like squash to keep off cucumber beetles early in the season, but I don't know fruit wise what you're planning to apply it to and what you're planning to get it to combat. Like it was going to be hard to get it all on like an apple tree or something. Um, so I'm not quite sure your your use for it but try looking in some other local garden centers more so than the big box because I've definitely found it in a few places here on the shore so the next question is would adding compost also bring the pH down that would 100% depend on the pH of the compost so compost is one of those things that is not created equally right like my garden compost could be very different than commercial manure compost. Um, so then if you are using your home compost, I would assume that it's it's probably not going to be super acidifying. Um, if you are purchasing compost, um, especially if you're purchasing like a whole um, pickup bed load um, from a place that makes compost, uh, they usually will have a report um, that you can ask them for that will give you information, kind of like a soil test. Um, about that compost, especially I know a lot of organic growers use mushroom compost. So it's the used um, substrate that they produce mushrooms on. A lot of times it's not necessarily low or high pH, but it'll have a lot of salts in it. So you definitely want to ask for that report. In general, I would say most composts that I have looked at um, reports for aren't going to be acidifying soils. And that's because usually if people are wanting compost, they usually don't want it to acidify their soils. Only blueberry people want that. Another thing that people think will acidify soils is coffee grounds. And while they are organic matter and they are fine to give to blueberry plants, they generally don't, once they have been used for coffee, they don't really acidify your soil. So honestly, the best way to bring down soil pH the fastest, which is organic, is using elemental sulfur. And even that still takes time yeah. because it's a biological process the way microbes in the soil break that sulfur down into or into acids so i think this is another great time to chime in and remind everyone that particularly with blueberries you need to plan ahead of time for them because you definitely need to drop that ph down before you put them down and this is another great one we would say get that soil test and take it from a professional lab because they'll also give you the ph buffering capacity some soils are going to be able to make that shift in pHs easier than others, mm -hmm. and your box store color-coded kits aren't going to help with that. So really consider going and getting a professional soil test done. Yep. But generally, the more organic matter you already have in your soil, the more sulfur and um, acidifying material you need. And that's because organic matter behaves as a buffer in soils. So you had mentioned birds feeding on blueberries. Um, can you tell me whether deer or other mammals will damage blueberries or other berry producing plants? So deer have not been a significant problem in my blueberry plantings. That said, I feel like hungry deer will eat. Like if they, if they develop a taste for blueberries, 
they're going to come after them because they'll eat a lot of things mm -hmm. that you wouldn't think that they would eat. Um, but I, I don't have enough deer where I have my more mature blueberry plants um, to know if they are smart enough to know to come after the berries yet. Um, birds are definitely smart enough to know. <laughs> and with deer, it, it's a lot easier to protect against birds with the bird netting than to deal with deer just because they're so much bigger. I feel like. Maybe you get some of the thorny blackberries and put them around the blueberries <laughs> to keep the deer away. <laughs> Uh, I, th I'm pretty sure, well, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a deer eat thorny blackberries. Maybe that's a good No, idea. but maybe they'd like come towards your blueberries and they'd hit the thorns and they'd be like, ow, this hurts. And then they'd go away. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of farms put up deer fencing because that's the only way they can. Yeah. Any thoughts or ideas about growing figs? Oh, figs are really fun and I didn't talk about them, but next time I'll have to do a different fruit talk with less yeah. conventional fruits. Um, so it is really going to depend where you're at in the state. Here on the lower eastern shore, we are kind of at the last sort of USDA zone where you can usually have figs. That said, I, like I think they're recommended for um, growing in zone eight or eight or higher, which are like southern places. Um, but they seem to do okay here. It's just if we had like a a crazy historic um, cold, um, long period of cold that could probably knock them back. That said, if you are someplace like Washington County, I don't think you could, you probably can't do figs because that's a whole USDA climate zone higher than Salisbury. But yeah, in uh, in the Lower Eastern Shore, you can grow figs, um, and those are they're pretty hardy. Um, there aren't going to be as many problems on a fig um, as you're going to have on something like an apple tree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I would encourage people to try figs. Yeah, I know our Home and Garden Information Center website has a whole page dedicated to figs, and they talk about specifically how you'd prune like a fig bush versus all the other ones. And it's really uh, a good website. I have a fig tree in my backyard and I love it. Yeah. It's another one that the birds a lot of times get all the fruit, but that's okay. Um, are they, do they require cross-pollination? I forget. And they're like fly pollinating. The one I have is uh, self-pollinating. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. You can just plant one and mm -hmm. try it. Yep. Okay. So then the next question was, uh, can we grow citrus in ground in Maryland? Oh, in ground. Well, or, oh, okay. No, no, no. In ground? No. Um, they said in ground. Yeah, no. Um, citrus are only going to be, they can take a freeze, but they can't take sustained cold. And especially something like a key lime, like they can barely take a freeze. Um, yeah, no citrus production for Maryland. Now that said, you can have, you can have like a lemon in a big pot that you wheel outside in the spring and that you bring inside um, in the winter. And I see a lot of people do that, but you're not going to get a whole bunch of lemons off of your like, you know, six foot tall lemon tree. Um, you, know, you have to live in like Florida to get Florida, Texas, or California for citrus production. Yeah. Okay. And that is all the questions that we have. Um, so if anyone has any others, they can quickly put them in the chat. Um, and with that, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Haley, for speaking about fruit. Uh, you got lots of good presentation comments. So with that, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. And I would say get out there and garden. Like the weather yeah. is beautiful. It's mm -hmm. not quite, don't put out your warm crops yet too early for your tomatoes we could still get some freeze but get out there and enjoy the weather do some weeding if you haven't planted beets or carrots or something i think those can go on the ground but yes enjoy that weather well bye everybody see you all in two weeks